Hare Krishna. So today morning, <coughs> we are coming toward the conclusion of the discussion between <coughs> Uddhava and Vidura. And there is remembrance of the Lord going on. And in general, the remembrance of the Lord is very relishable. The pastimes of the Lord are extremely sweet. And Kula Shekhar Maharaj says, Sukhataram aparam na jatu jane Haricharana smaranam rute na tulyam He says the remembrance of the lotus feet of the Lord is like nectar. He says there's no nectar like it in fact. It's not just like nectar, no nectar is like it. So it's incomparable. And yet, the Chaitanya Charitamrita describes, so I'll be using this as a whiteboard to write and draw certain things. Mm. So nectar, the Chaitanya Charitamrita indicates, can be paradoxically of two kinds. You can have sweet nectar and you can have bitter nectar. <laughs> now, uh, the very idea of nectar, we would think it implies it is sweet. But how can there be bitter nectar? The Chaitanya Charitamrita used the example of hot sugar cane juice. It is extremely sweet, so you can't stop drinking it. But at the same time, it's so hot that we can't tolerate it. So basically, you know, in, there is a fundamental contrast between spiritual life and material life. And sometimes we face it, this world is Dukkhalaya. People say, no, there is pleasure in this world also. People say, no, it's Maya. But people who are in Maya don't think it is Maya. Isn't it? We think that's, that's the pleasure, that's the purpose of life. That's what they're driving for. Kamopa bhoga parama etavaditi nishchita. They think this pleasure is the purpose of life. Krishna, in one sense, parodies them by saying, etavad iti nishchita. We have ascertained it. There is no, there is no question about doubting it. There is one European philosopher who said, the problem with the world is that the foolish are doubtful and the wise, then the, sorry, the foolish, sorry, the wise are doubtful and the foolish are confident. <laughs> so, those who are pursuing material pleasures, sex, wealth, power, prestige, they are completely confident, if I just get this, I will be happy. And those who are pursuing Krishna, hey, does Krishna really exist? Will Krishna protect me? So, this is the situation. The wise are doubtful and the foolish are confident. In fact, cocksure. Totally sure. So what happens is, in material life, what we experience is like poison. But even poison, sometimes is bitter and sometimes it is sweet. So, when the poison is sweet, it's still poison. Now why is it poison? Because it is making us forget Krishna. And when we are forgetting Krishna, we are going away from reality. And even if that dream is temporarily pleasant, but it's still getting us into illusion. So, it some, so just as material life can have duality, it can sometimes be enjoyable. But in one sense we could say, bitter poison will make, it, make us want to stop drinking. Sweet poison will make, want to make us drink more and more. So, <clears throat> that's why you know, many people turn towards God in distress, but without the, do we stay with God in happiness? That is also a significant test, if not a bigger test. So anyway, the point is that just as there are both sides in material life, there is pleasure. But the foundation is, because there is forgetfulness of Krishna, it's illusion. Similarly, in the remembrance of Krishna, because there is connection with Krishna, that is nectar. But within that also there is, there is duality. It's a transcendental duality. But it is there. Just like in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, we have love in separation and love in union. There is duality in one sense. But the foundation is, in both cases, 
the devotees are absorbed in Krishna. So the remembrance of Krishna comes in many different flavors. There is sweet nectar and there is also bitter nectar. So now, why am I talking about this right now? Because this particular narrative that is going on is very much like bitter nectar. That's why there may be Bhagavad Kathas. Practically nobody does uh, Bhagavad Katha on the destruction of the Yadu dynasty. We'll do on the Gopi Geet, we'll do on the um, Krishna's Kaliya Daman Leela, Govardhan Leela, so many other pastimes. Because this is painful, this is distressing. And not only it's distressing to hear about the destruction, but it can also be disruptive of the faith. So we will try to process this part. So this bitter nectar, when there are pastimes which are difficult to process, difficult to understand. Prabhupada gives an example that just like, or rather the Bhagavatam gives an example, Prabhupada elaborates on it that just like a fire occurs in the forest. Like that, this conflict occurred between the their descendants in the Yadu dynasty and they were all destroyed. So we will discuss, basically, I'll start from something like playing the devil's advocate and then we'll move towards more and more into Shastra to understand the spirit. So when something like this happens, see in spiritual life, there is an explanation. Sometimes somebody gives an explanation, hey, why were you late? And then that person gives an answer. Well, that's not an explanation. That's an excuse. So now, quite often, what one person thinks is an explanation, the other person thinks it's an excuse. So now, so you could say on one extreme, there's an excuse. There's an explanation and there's an excuse. And now how do we differentiate that? Hmm. So excuse is something which we give when we don't have an explanation. So, so, I know, <laughs> I was talking, uh, so, so, so I was talking, I was staying at one devotee's house and there's a parrot and a, they have a teenage kid. So the teenage kid had done something very, very, very irritating to his parents. The parents were saying, you know, uh, so, you know, you, he says, so he was saying, I have an explanation. He says, no. You are young and your hormones are running and they have no explanation. He says, that was my explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so now, is that an explanation? <laughs> so, so there is always a dispute, is something an explanation or an excuse? And two people can sometimes never agree on that. But in spiritual life, there is one more dynamic. And that is experience. In spirituality, we are ultimately seeking the experience of God. Bhakti Pareshanubhava Viraktir Anyatracha. Bhakti is a process that gives us experience of Krishna. And that is what matters the most. In the Brihad Bhagavatamrat, uh, when the journey of the Gopa Kumar is described, at that time, the Sanatana Goswami, while narrating it, says that Anubhav or experience is the highest Pramana. We talk about Pratyaksha, Anuman, Shabda as Pramana, and of course they are important. Right? At the same time, he is talking from the perspective of the Gopu Kumar. He goes to the spiritual world, he experiences Vaikuntha, he experiences Yodhya, he experiences Dwarka, and then finally he feels yes, Vrindavan, and Vrindavan Krishna is the highest and the most attractive. And in that context, Nathan Goswami is saying that this, this experience is the ultimate praman, it's the ultimate confirmatory test. So, ultimately, this is, in our tradition, the highest praman. Now, that doesn't mean other things are not important. Explanations are important, but these are three different things. So, we will... Today, try to understand 
the difference between these three things and we'll see how we can seek an explanation. We'll try to say how to identify and avoid excuses, how to seek an explanation, but how to seek most the experience of Krishna. Because that is what our ultimate purpose and perfection is. So if we move forward. Now here, <clears throat> what has happened is extremely disturbing. I just gave the Hindi Bhagavatam class sometime, it took a couple of days ago. In theology, the study of God, there are two questions which are very difficult to understand. In Western philosophy, from the time of Plato and others, these are called as natural evil and moral evil. Natural evil is basically, why do bad things happen to good people? And this is a perplexing question. Now, in our tradition, we have the explanation of karma. And yet, if you see in the Bhagavatam, that is not the explanation that is constantly being trotted out. It's not just used as a, uh, as a one catch-all explanation for all suffering. If you'll see, the, actually, the Bhagavatam's, uh, di- Bhagavatam's analytical frame is much deeper than karma. But that is one explanation. So why do bad things happen to good people? But what is often even more problematic is, why do good people do bad things? In fact, in one sense we could say that both challenge our faith in God. So, but in the first case, okay, why, why did God let this happen? Depending on our philosophical worldview, world did God make this happen or did God let this happen? Whichever way it is. But why did God let that happen? Even if he says it's let. Krishna says, Upadrashta Anumanta I am the permitter. That's disturbing. But in general, for most people, their faith in God is based to a large extent on their faith in those who represent God. That's why one of the, in our tradition also, the key sign of spiritual advancement from Kanishtra Adhikari to Madhyama Adhikari is appreciation of the value of devotees, of the value of association. So it is an association that we get faith that yes, yeah, God exists. There are two different things, God's existence and God's relevance. When I was introduced to Bhakti, I started talking with my relatives. So one of my uncles, he said, I believe in God. He's happy there, I'm happy here. So, <laughs> oh, why do I need God as such? Well, no, I didn't want to say, in India I still have conservative, so that I could say, you are not going to be happy for very long. <laughs> I didn't say that to him. But, but the point is that, okay, the world is a place of ups and downs. So God's existence is important uh, to know, of course, but the relevance of God's existence, why does it matter? That we learn primarily in the association of devotees. Not just in terms of philosophy, but also in terms of experience. That God is, it is through the association of those who are devoted to God, that our conception of God evolves. You could say evolution in the conception of God. So initially, we think of God as the fulfiller of desires. Okay, if I pray to God, God will give me this, God will give me that. And Krishna appreciates such people also. Krishna says in 7.16, Sukruti no, Janaha Sukruti no Arjuna. They are good people, they are coming to me. But then, from this point, 7.16, when we go to 7.19, that is, Mahat, that is, Bahunam Janmanam Ante, Gyanavan Maam Prapadyate. Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samhatma Sudurlabha. So Vasudeva Sarvamiti, God is not just the fulfiller of desires, He is the fulfillment of desires. That means 
that God doesn't just give me blessings. He's not just a source of blessings. God himself is the greatest blessing. That if Krishna's presence starts manifesting in my heart, if that starts enriching my heart, then there's no greater enrichment that's possible. So this we understand primarily by associating with those who are seeking God as the ultimate fulfillment of all desire. Many of the people who met, met Prabhupada, who later on became leaders in our movement, they came from a Judeo-Christian background. They all had uh, some familiarity with the conception of God and religion. But it was, many of them said that, you know, it was more like a ritual religion. The total devotion to God. Like making God uh, not just, making God like the centerpiece of our life, not the showpiece of our life. Oh, I worship God also. Prabhupada would surprise a joke. It was like, some people come to there for them, having a guru is like a fashion. It's like, you know, okay, this is my this is my chandelier, this is my car, this is my dog, and this is my guru. <laughs> 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 so, like that God or guru, sometimes they can just be showpieces in people's life. But Prabhupada is a person for whom God was the be-all and end-all. Krishna was the center, the fulcrum, the pivot of his very existence. And that was what drew people. And India is a remarkably pious country, among various countries in the world, of course. Uh, religion is re having a resurgence to some extent. But, that there's, I saw a cartoon recently, there's a group of an American is asking an Indian, you know, why do you people worship so many gods? And the Indian replies, because we believe in backups. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's philosophically completely off. <laughs> but the idea is, with Krishna, we understand we don't need any backup. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. He is everything for us. So that evolution in the conception of God, that comes primarily by the association of devotees. And that's why when somebody who is a devotee, or whom we see not just as a devotee, but an exalted devotee, they do something bad, that is very disruptive to our faith. So, this is where this particular pastime, where the Yadus, they get drunk and they fight among each other and there's a drunken brawl in which they just destroy each other. That, it's very disoriented. How could that happen? So, I look over some of the explanations that are given and I was talking with one devotee. See, he was going through some difficulties in his spiritual life and he was telling me, this is, now that I read script Shastra, I see that there are no explanations, there are excuses. And he said, this is simply an excuse. This particular thing, he says that this is a standard logical error. He says, a giving a metaphor is not explaining a cause. He says, okay, so just like fire occurs in a wood, in a forest, like that this occurred. He says, okay, just by giving a metaphor, you are not giving an explanation. Uh, it doesn't explain anything. So, and he was saying that, okay, if they could not be destroyed and Krishna, it happened by Krishna's will, well, Krishna could have done it any other way. Why did Krishna have to them kill each other? You know, it's not that all Kshatriyas have to die in a battlefield only. It's that they can die gracefully. Dhruva Maharaj didn't die that way. He just, he was a Kshatriya. He sat down in meditation and the vehicle of the Lord came, the Vaikuntha airplane came. Why couldn't that have come? So he is saying, this is no explanation at all. This is just an excuse. I said, you know, the excuse argument can run both ways. Atheists often say that, you know, that God is just like a crutch for you. You people are weak. 
you people are weak and that's why you imagine a god so that you have some father figure to protect you so god is just you just it's a psychological creation well maybe but the psychological creation argument runs both ways you know you are an atheist you don't want to believe in god so it is your psychological need to create the argument that god is a psychological need <laughs> isn't it the once you go a psychological need everybody has psychological needs so how do you prove a psycho just because a psychological need does not prove whether the actual reality is there or not there isn't it so i was telling this devotee you know you were reading the same scriptures before and you were reading for many years this is at that time you found uh, found uh, them nourishing so i said with all due respect so generally whenever somebody says with all due respect <laughs> what they are going to say after that is not very respectful <laughs> so i said with all due respect you know you need to search your heart is it that you are looking for excuses to give up your krishna consciousness you know you have been hurt you feel betrayed by what happened that's i mean what i empathize with what has happened to you but if you are looking for excuses then krishna will give that to you now krishna is a desire fulfilling tree if we want reasons to come closer to krishna krishna will give those to us if you want excuses to stay away from krishna krishna will give those to us also that is the meaning of a desire fulfilling tree and this is one thing which uh, i learned early in my childhood many of you notice that i need crutches for walking so i had polio i was just walking normally one day and i fell down and i couldn't walk after that so it was it is it recovered a little bit and at least i have some mobility now so my mother told me my father used to mostly travel so i was uh, my mother used to take care of me she said that you know when i i she, she, we did some therapy some exercises and then I, i tried to walk i had a brace and i would say it's very painful i can't walk so my mother would say that you know you have to be honest with yourself i don't know how much pain you are in she says if you use the pain as a excuse for not walking then you will never learn to walk but if you are not able to walk i am not going to force you but it is you will be you will be immobilized if you use it as an excuse so be honest with yourself so yes everybody will have limitations and challenges at a physical level at a emotional level at a spiritual level now are we going to use that as an excuse that is something which we have to honestly investigate so the excuse argument could run both ways that you could say this is a excuse because you don't have an explanation why krishna did something like this okay and this is the explain this is your excuse that you don't want to you want to go away from krishna now a what <clears throat> what would differentiate an excuse from an explanation now the point is that the bhagavatam itself gives us one of in general when we want to differentiate between the two it's very difficult to differentiate this in isolation hmm? when a particular person gives a particular reason now if that is all that we are hearing you know if somebody comes late and they say you know i was i was caught in traffic uh, and now now if we are meeting them for the first time and i can say yeah, everybody gets caught in traffic at times but somebody who knows them and they say you know it's like every time they get caught in traffic <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes after sometimes the, the that particular explanation becomes a tired trope is telling it again and again and again so if somebody is using the same explanation again and again and again then we would start saying yeah maybe this is an excuse you know you should know that in the city the traffic is like this and you have to prepare in advance so in general this different this differentiation 
cannot be made in isolation it has to be made in context when a person is giving a particular answer or scripture is giving a particular answer then what is the overall body within which it is being spoken so if a person is normally very responsible and competent and then they make a mistake of and you say you know i'm sorry this happened that happened okay we could accept that as x uh, okay it happens sometimes but that's what a person habitually doing that that's the context so context is the bigger picture and the bhagavatam itself while it gives multiple explanations it it in especially in the 11th canto it gives us the bigger context the bigger context it says is that if we look at the let's move away from this past time to the other part of it that krishna is hit by an arrow and then that and he leaves a material body behind apparently and goes and it is his life ends over here so now if we look at it from a, a literal perspective a wound on the leg is not fatal it's rarely fatal mm. now it is of course in hollywood movies nobody dies <laughs> you know, there's all this parallel universes and this and bionic chips and the villains keep coming back again and again and again <laughs> so <laughs> that's a different thing <laughs> but generally oh, it's like sometimes even the hero there are bullets going all around them there are bullets going through them and also they seem to nothing is happening <laughs> but here krishna was at arjuna and arjuna was shot by hundreds and thousands of arrows and many of them hit krishna in all parts of the body and they didn't injure krishna much and how did an arrow that just hit his leg and different people also hit arrows with different forces so it was just a ordinary hunter over there it is not like some big warrior whose arrow would have a severe wounding capacity that arrow hit the leg and then why would that cause krishna to in double quotes die so if krishna the bhagavatam uses the example that krishna went to the abode of yamaraj and most people they go to the abode of yamaraj they don't come back and they don't go willingly isn't it <laughs> krishna went willingly and he came back from there not only did he come back he brought someone back from there and you know, that is extraordinary so that is the power of krishna how could that krishna who could go to yamaraj and counter yamaraj's authority be pierced by a mere arrow so there has to be something more going on over there so in general if you go back to the principle of karma so the idea is there is action and there is some result a reaction you can say that action leads to a result so the general principle of karma is if somebody does a action worth unit 5 they will get a result worth unit 5 mm-hmm. but if somebody does action worth 5 and they get a result worth 5000 and now what it means is that there is something more going on over there that means this particular result is also of some previous action mm-hmm. what is happening at that point is also due to some previous action that's why if somebody seems to get angry with us for no reason and that's when we say don't get too angry with the instrument of your own karma the idea is that now if we have not done anything to set the person off and that person is set off that means it's some past karma coming to us that's what uh, when lakshman is enraged at the exile of ram hmm. i just came from ayodhya the beautiful darshan of ram lala is there over there and then they, they are now building 108 temples around the main temple and four five main temples but 108 temples were all the major past times of lord ram will be depicted over there so the ayodhya vasis generally their sentiment is they don't like to depict the 
they depict the ex the exile of ram they focus on his pastimes there and even they depict the exile is heartbreaking so but the point is when that happens lakshman is enraged and he says initially is angry with dashrath you know that this he he was just you know he's he's controlled by his wife he's carried away by lust he's not fit to be a king and ram says i was with dashrath and he said whatever is being done there's no infatuation there's only a painful obligation over there so he said that you know these wow these promises that he had given to kai kai we never heard about these promises how did they come up just now only so ram says do you claim to know everything about what happens between our parents and you know you see when we are angry we need someone to be angry at so then lakshman's anger shifts from ram to kai kai and he says this kai kai you have nothing but be respectful and good to her how could she have done like this ram says don't criticize her now you know that her love for me was just like my mother's love it was like the flowing water of ganga pure and unceasing now lakshman is still angry sometimes anger makes people eloquent <laughs> so he says that's what i can't understand how did the ganga dry up in one night <laughs> <laughs> and then ram replies that's why when i heard this heard these words from her i understood this is not kai kai speaking this is not kai kai is doing this is the will of destiny this is the will of destiny and the point is lord ram is telling us when within the immediate context we can't figure things out there is something bigger going on over there there's something from a past life coming and ultimately it's destiny now of course lakshman is still not satisfied lakshman says only cowards accept injustice as destiny heroes fight against injustice he says you should fight he says don't just passively accept destiny so that time lord ram replies for me i'm not just accepting destiny i am doing my duty as my duty to my father i was ready to step up on the throne as a duty to my father i will now go to the forest so he was not simply passively caving into destiny otherwise when sita was abducted ram could have said oh it's my destiny i accept it no he didn't because it was his duty to protect his wife so he did that so the point is that when something is happening when it doesn't make sense in the immediate context we have to look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture can be seen at multiple levels so any event that is happening see if an event is happening you could have multiple levels of causes for it say right now if i am feeling cold maybe i am feeling cold because I, the ac is behind me maybe i am feeling cold because i am wearing not warm clothes enough maybe i am feeling cold because i am not used to this weather maybe i am feeling cold because i have got fever there are multiple explanations isn't it now which explanation should we focus on which level of explanation that requires intelligence if i start feeling cold and say oh you know it's all global warming and climate change and we are all doomed well okay but what are you going to do about it and look for a explanation that is constructive for us that helps us to do something so there are multiple explanations for the same event so we have to see we have to look for the level of explanation that helps us move closer to krishna that is the key principle krishna says dadami buddhi yogam tam i will give you the intelligence by which you can come to me and when bhajatam priti purvakam when i am when we are trying to practice bhakti devotionally so satsurup maharaj writes in one of his books that when one senior leader had some difficulties 
and he went down so they were very disturbed and he said i was thinking you know he was such a power he was such a powerful leader and he would give such classes how could he have done this 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 thing and we talk with prabhupad prabhupad said maya is very strong and we need to be very careful so prabhupad did not make it personal okay why did this person do this now you could go into the specifics and we could try to find out okay what exactly happened with this person but prabhupad took a explanation that is at a much bigger level and that's what is actionable for us maya is dangerous we have maya is uh, very powerful we have to be careful so we have to see which level of explanation is helpful for us and focus on that level of explanation so the, now when i say which is level of explanation the bhagavatam does not deny over here that they got drunk chetasam as it says vishami krut chetasam that their consciousness got disrupted it got no so that that is a cause why mariyan they they drank so it gives one explanation they drank and then they got disrupted they got they went mad so now sometimes people say hey, how, how could yudhishthir maharaj have gambled how could the others have drunk now if they drink if they gamble then why shouldn't we well that is the exact opposite of the lesson that the bhagavatam is telling us and even a person of yudhishthir maharaj's caliber when he gambles the mania of gambling can be so much that it can it can draw him in also so if a person of his caliber can get get captivated then what about us therefore we should not gamble if people of the caliber of the yadus can get so violently destructively disoriented then what about us so the lesson is so the bhagavatam does not uh, downplay or deny that level of they got drunk so then the bhagavatam also gives the explanation that it was it was they had offended a brahmana and that's why the sages and that's why they got a curse but the bhagavatam does not highlight that explanation also it says now if you go to jiva goswami he gives so if we consider this event the yadus self destruction now there are various explanations for it one of it they just got drunk and fought drunken brawl it was hmm? it's a fact but how could they do something like that then you could say it was the sages curse that destroyed their intelligence then beyond that it is said it is the lord's will hmm? now there is one more explanation that jiva goswami gives that he says this is asura mohan leela asura mohan leela means that this is a past time to bewilder the demoniac and he gives the example of the mohini murti in fact that is a metaphor which vishwanath chakravarti uses repeatedly he says mohini murti is vishnu but the effect of mohini murti on the demons was that their illusion increased generally we say attraction to the lord will take away our illusion isn't it the more we are attracted said the deities the less will be attracted to mundane beauty so generally attraction to the lord takes away our illusion but in this case attraction to the lord was their illusion isn't it now how does that happen well that happens because of their particular mentality that their mentality was trying to they were exploitative and the lord played into their fantasies they they got caught over there so the point is that the lord is who he is and ultimately any way we connect with the lord is beneficial but if somebody doesn't want to surrender to the lord then even a manifestation of the lord can take someone away from the lord it may not take somebody towards the lord so i remember in, in my early days of bhakti i have i had invited my relatives i was staying in the juhu temple i was in pune but i had come to mumbai so i really invited some of my relatives and i was talking to them of bhakti and i was explaining things to them and then after that, after they left i could call them and ask them how was your visit oh it was a, it is a very productive visit for us said, very good i said oh, what was productive he says we just moved into a new house 
and we were trying to decide what furniture we want to buy. So in the Jew guest room, the furniture that we saw, that's the kind of furniture we want to buy. <laughs> So, <laughs> they were not attracted, rather Ras Bihari, they were not attracted to anything else. <laughs> so, okay, that's the video of Kalpataru. <laughs> if that's what, what you want is what you're going to get. So, ultimately, yes, the Lord is there, but what we want, that's why the difference between excuse and explanation, it ultimately boils down to what do I want. Do I want a re reason to go toward Krishna or do I want an excuse to go away from Krishna? And that brings me to the last part. So, so the point is that whichever explanation, whichever level of explanation helps us to move closer to Krishna, that is the level of explanation we seek to accept. So the Lord does Asur Mohan because some people want to be deluded. And then the Lord has these kind of pastimes. So whichever level of explanation satisfies us, we take that. And sometimes, what if no explanation that is there satisfies us? Then, at that time, Jiva Goswami explains that reason, in general, Prabhupada uses the word intelligence for buddhi. In most Western philosophical circles, the word they use is reason. That reason and rational thinking. So, reason is meant to be our minister. It is not meant to be our master. Hmm? Minister is someone whom we consult. Hmm? Jiva Swami says that if with our buddhi we can understand everything about Krishna, then it is not Krishna who is supreme, it is our buddhi which becomes supreme. So in principle itself, if we accept that God is supreme, that means there will be some things about God that we will not understand with our intelligence. And being willing to accept that is itself a part of our devotion. So we may have great intelligence and there may be other devotees who have greater intelligence than us. And talking with them may help us get some more acceptable explanations. But in principle we have to accept that maybe there are some questions I may not get answers to. Now, is this an excuse? Well, if that is the answer we give for every question, then it is an excuse. You know, for example, the word achintya. Mm, it's not, achintya should not be like a philosophical whitewashing tool. Then the explanation for everything. Some devotee gives a seminar, we should do japa very attentively. And then they do that japa, you play that devotee sleeping. Oh, why is that devotee sleeping? Oh, it is achintya. <laughs> well, we don't want to offend that devotee, but there are things which we need to seek explanation for. We can't just say everything is achintya. So that's why if we start using the achintya too much, then that will start seeming like an excuse. Generally, Jiva Goswami uses achintya for a very specific purpose. He uses achintya for what? There is two scriptural statements. Both are true and both are apparently contradictory. So the ultimate reality has form, the ultimate reality does not have form. So how can these two be reconciled? That is achintya. Achintya is not just a tool to explain away anything that we can't explain. Hmm? So, so but if we, the principle of achintya is that there are some things which will be beyond our intelligence. We could say that as we grow, as we study scripture, our intelligence will keep growing. True. Spiritual growth will lead to our intellectual growth also. But still Krishna will always remain bigger than our intelligence. No matter how big we grow, there will be always things which will be beyond our understanding. So we accept that. But that doesn't mean everything is beyond our understanding. There are many things for which we get answers right away. In the first day of our spiritual life, we get answers to so many questions. And as we keep studying, we keep getting more and more answers. But there will always be things that we don't know. So that is, that is the role of humility. In fact, humility is not just chanting Trunadapi Sunichena or 
bowing down to devotees. I would say in the spiritual path, intellectual humility is extremely important. That means accepting that some things will be unknowable. That we may never get an explanation that satisfies our intelligence. This is not an excuse for not seeking explanation. This is not an excuse for not trying to give satisfactory explanations. If we are preachers, if somebody asks questions, you should be humble and don't ask questions. No, that's not what we should be doing. But there are some things. What is important is that whether we get an explanation or not, we can still experience Krishna. The process of bhakti is such that even if some question is troubling us, we chant Hare Krishna, we participate in Kirtan, we take darshan of the deities, we experience something higher in our life. And that experience is what we seek the most. In fact, when an explanation doesn't, doesn't satisfy our head, the experience can still satisfy our heart. So we may be troubled, why did this happen? Why did this devotee do like this? We come in front of the deities and pray to Krishna. We pour out our heart to Krishna. We call out to Krishna. And we experience. We experience some upliftment, some enrichment, some connection, some sense of presence, power, whatever we want to say. There is some element of the mystical that we experience when we practice bhakti. We may not necessarily use the word mystical, but we experience something higher and that's what keeps us going. So we don't let the need for an explanation come in the way of the experience of Krishna. And Shraddhaval Labhate Gyanam. Normally the idea is knowledge. The, this, is, this is the part of explanation I'll conclude with. At 4.39, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that faith will lead to knowledge and ultimately that will lead to the supreme peace. So quite often we say that it is knowledge that will lead to faith. Siddhanta baliya chitte na kare alas iha haite krishna lage sudruda manas. You study more, your faith will increase. That is true through that. But here Krishna is taking a different hierarchy. He says, faith will lead to knowledge. Krishna, I don't know what is happening. I don't know why this is happening. But I have faith, you have some plan. When Prabhupada is in America, or he's about to reach America, he composes the Markine Bhagavad Dharma song. What is he doing at that time? He says, Ache kichu karja tabe anumane. Nahi keno ani bena e ugrasthane. You must have some plan. Otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? So, Anuman, Prabhupada is doing Anuman speculation. Speculation is not the right word here. It's Prabhupada is making an estimate, drawing an inference. Krishna, in my old age, there could have been so many things could have gone wrong, but you have brought me here. God has not brought us so far to abandon us now. We may be facing a crisis right now which can seem uh, life's ending. But we have all been through many challenges in our life. It is Krishna who has brought us this far. That Lord who has brought us this far is not going to abandon us now. That is what Prabhupada is saying. You must have some plan. Otherwise, why would you bring me here? So, that is Shraddha. And Prabhupada says that Shraddha, he says, Na chao, na chao, Prabhu, na chao, Simati. Krishna, make me dance, make me dance. Like a puppet, make me dance. So the idea is, then Prabhupada tried out various things. Prabhupada tried in butler pencil, and then he was treated like a curiosity object, not like a philosophical teacher. If it had been the, if it had been the age of social media, the people in butler, Swamiji, that's one selfie with you. <laughs> <laughs> They're not interested in hearing from him. Hmm? People want to have a selfie, not know the self. You know? <laughs> so, but when Prabhupada moved to New York, first he was in up city, then he went to down, uh, down uh, the hay, then he went to the Lower East Side, and that's where he got people, various people he tried, places he tried out. Something worked eventually. So, if we have that Shraddha, then the Jnana about how to keep moving towards Krishna, what, when to seek an explanation, what explanation to accept, when to put aside an explanation and just keep moving towards an experience, Sometimes the way to the heart is through the head. Sometimes we have to just bypass the head and go to the heart. 
So whichever works, we focus on the experience and that is what gives us the conviction. Yes, Krishna is still the Lord and I still want to stay connected with Krishna. And maybe in future, some of the questions that are unanswered, we will get some answers for them which will be more satisfactory. But whatever happens, we don't let our head, our logic, our reasoning faculty become our master. We don't let the head take the charge and close the door to Krishna. You have not got an answer to this, so you don't go to Krishna anymore. No, the head is a minister. We take advice from it. Sometimes we accept the advice, sometimes we don't accept the advice. We focus on uh, connecting with Krishna and using the head in a way that it helps us connect with Krishna. Okay, this particular event, I don't have an explanation for this. But there are many other things in my life that I've understood through the Krishna philosophy. And that's what draws me forward. We are not being intellectually negligent, but we're just being intellectually humble. And we keep moving forward, making sure that our journey toward Krishna goes on steadily. For us, we are hearing this thousands of years later. Vidura heard it at that very time. But what did he do? He didn't become disoriented. Hey, you know, I thought Krishna is God and he couldn't protect his own family. His own family fought and killed and he didn't do anything. What is the use of worshipping Krishna? He didn't think like that. He took deeper shelter of Krishna. He went to Maitreya, heard from him and became more enlightened. And then he came back and he even enlightened the Dhritarashtra. So the Mahajano yena gataha sapantha. Alvedura is not exactly on the list of 12 Mahajanas, but still he is also a great soul. And we can learn from his example of how he processes this event and make sure that he keeps moving toward Krishna. So I'll summarize. I discussed uh, broadly today um, the difference between explanation, excuse and uh, the need for explanation in bhakti or the role of explanations in bhakti. So we talked first, uh, the first point I discussed was about there could be nectar that is sweet and there could be nectar that is bitter. So this particular leela is like bitter nectar. The Yadudvaha leela is now, why is there this kind of thing? Well, there is, there is a duality, transcendental duality in the spiritual domain also. And then we discussed how do we know the difference between an ex if somebody said this is an excuse, well, it runs both ways. You could say, this is an excuse because you don't have an explanation. Well, you could say because you, you want an excuse to go away from Krishna. Is, it, is, it, is belief in God a psychological crutch? Well, disbelief in God can also be a psychological crutch. So just saying something as an excuse is no way to actually evaluate. What we need is to know what is an excuse. We can't see in isolation that particular argument alone. We have to see it in context. When a person gives a particular explanation, a, a particular reason, so we have to look at their history. Similarly, when we are looking at the philosophy, don't just look at one thing, look at it in the big picture. And then we evaluate. And then we discussed about how the same event can have multiple levels of explanations. So when I do an action worth 5 and I get a reaction worth 5000, then that means something more is going on. So we have to look at the bigger picture. Our philosophy gives us many bigger contexts in which we can put things. So when a bigger picture is required, now which explanation to accept? That is where we understand Buddhi Yoga. The key to do ki Buddhi Yoga is, Krishna says, Ye nama mupayantite. That you use your Buddhi to do yoga. That means you, see, you seek the explanation that inspires you to stay connected with me, to become more connected with me, to come closer to me. So we see the explanation that is devotionally favorable. And then we talked about intellectual humility. That the principle is while we can seek answers and we should, but ultimately our intelligence will always be less than Krishna. And accepting that some things may not be ever answered. That is what we need to accept so that our logic, our reason, it is our minister. We take advice from it, we don't, it is our minister, we don't make it our master. And that means sometimes the head is the way to the heart for us. And sometimes we put aside the head and we just go straight to the heart. 
It is in the heart that we experience Krishna. So the process of bhakti works whether our head gets some explanation or not. We focus on that experience. Staying connected with Krishna. Krishna has not brought us this far to abandon us now. Let's stay connected with Krishna. And in due course, whether we will get an explanation for what has happened or we'll come to peace with even the lack of a satisfactory explanation. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. I know I've already gone a little over time, but is there any one question or comment anyone has? Yes, is there a mic? Yes, yes, mic. Yeah, Mataji. And we can go to the Hare Krishna, uh, so you spoke about desires and you said uh, desire it's not the ultimate uh, fulfillment so we should not kind of pour only our desires to Krishna. So can I link desire and surrender because when we are sorry like when we depend on our parents, we kind of just keep asking them for everything. Yeah, correct. So can we approach Krishna with this? Okay, so when I said, uh, can we, so the question is, can we desire to, from Krishna to help us surrender to him? See, again, desires are not a problem. Ultimately, desiring faculty is what is innately given to us. And Krishna has not given us our desiring faculty so that we suppress it. But so Prabhupada had a desire. His Guru Maharaj told him, preach in the Western world. Prabhupada did that. In, in the 1970s, when Prabhupada came to India, he said, my Guru Maharaj wanted me to preach in the West. I done that. Now, I want to preach in India. Now you help me in doing that. Now Prabhupada's desire was not independent of his spiritual master's desire. He wanted to consolidate the mission. He says, we have, pre have devotees in the West, but they need some spiritual foundation in India. And that's why we need temples here. So you help me in that. It is a continuation of that. So if... Our desire is favorable to bhakti, anukul. Then certainly we can pray to that, pray for that. Prabhupada desire, says in a third canto, the Kardamuni pastime, that a devotee desires to see Krishna, but a devotee does not demand to see Krishna. So having desires is, is not normal, I would say it's necessary. Bhakti is not just about giving up desires. Yes, it is about giving up material desires, but it is much more about taking up spiritual desires. No, there were many of Prabhupada's God brothers, with all due respect to them. Some of them were lifelong renunciates. Some of them were very much more scholarly in a literal scriptural or linguistic sense than Prabhupada. What distinguished Prabhupada, among many things, was his burning desire to fulfill the desire of his spiritual master. So actually, desire is a great asset on the spiritual path. Tatra laulyam api maulyam ekalam, greed is the qualification of getting Krishna. So yes, certainly, we evaluate whether a desire is favorable for our bhakti and if it is, then definitely we can pray for the fulfillment of that desire. But we don't make our bhakti conditional to the fulfillment of that desire. Does it answer your question? Thank you. Yes, please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you for the class. Uh, my question is about proper discrimination. At the proper? Discrimination. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning the three types of pramans of which experience is the highest. Yeah. Uh, we have that famous morning walk with Prabhupada when Prabhupada asked, how do you know Krishna is God? And different devotees were saying different things. And we said, well, because I feel it. And Prabhupada said, yes, that's correct. Yet in other places, we find that Prabhupada says common sense is always faulty. And you know, we should just take Shastra. So my question is, how do we know when, you know, and it's also that past time where some thief was running away and, you know, the, 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 the person who was chasing the, the thief came to that sage and the sage told the truth because the Shasta said that you shouldn't lie, right? And on that basis, he had to go to hell. You follow? Yeah. So the, the point is that, how do we know when we have to follow the scripture 
rigidly on how we have to use our common sense to adjust, like the difference between a detail and a principle, basically. Okay, yeah. yeah. See, this is uh, what makes life complicated. <laughs> that sometimes we say scripture is like a manual for life. I nowadays prefer the word guidebook, not manual. Because manual literally means the device manual, you press this button, this will happen. You pull this lever, this will happen. Life is not that simple. Isn't it? So, Prince, scripture gives some guidebook, it's a guidebook for us. And even if you see within scripture itself, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam itself, when uh, Arjun has to decide what to do with Ashwatthama. At that time there are two sides, Bhima on one side, Yudhishthira on one side. And Krishna is with him. But Krishna does not give him an answer. And Arjuna has to deliberate and decide. So in my small understanding is that actually Krishna is preparing Arjuna to be independently thoughtful. Soon, that is 1.7. In 1.15, that's the seventh chapter of the first canto, 1.15, Krishna has departed. What is Arjuna going to do at that time? And that time Arjuna is devastated initially, but then eventually he remembers the words of the Bhagavad Gita and he calms himself down. So it's not that there is going to be that life is going to give us ready answers. It is not that also that you know we have to make our intelligence like Google or Chat GPT that every situation comes up, we find some reference. Oh, this reference is so I should be doing this. Yeah, it's good to have references, but the, they are references, they are not instructions. That which reference to apply now, that for that we need to use our own intelligence. So the purpose of scripture is not to replace our intelligence, it is to reinforce our intelligence. It is our intellectual responsibility to decide what to do. And we will make mistakes sometimes, but that's how we learn and we grow. So, in particular situations, what to do? Well, we pray, we study scripture, if we have uh, de devotees around us whom we can consult, we consult them, and then we make the best decision that we can. Uh, if we develop an ethos of outsourcing responsibility for decision making to someone else, and that's not a very healthy way to function. We can definitely, if our spiritual master is there, it's a big issue, we talk with our spiritual master. But in general, I have talked with many spiritual masters who, who are now at a stage where they want to, they are planning succession. So then, you know, it's like the, the whole, whole mood is that the spiritual masters train the devotees to think and decide for themselves. They don't just become the direct decision givers. Sometimes that's required. But overall, that doesn't seem to be the overall ethos. So yes, there are no black and white answers. And it's a whole gamut of resources. That okay, we consult our own experience, we consult our heart, we also consult our head. We consult other people, other Vaishnavas. And based on all this, we look at scripture ourselves. And then we come up with a come up with a path. And in general, like Sometimes people say, this is, this is doing Prabhupada, following Prabhupada, this is not following Prabhupada. Now, of course, there can be things which are completely contrary to Prabhupada's teachings. But following Prabhupada, in my small understanding, is not just one line. It's like a broad circle. And within that, one person can be on one side and following Prabhupada. One person can be on the other side and following Prabhupada. So it's more like, that's why mood and mission. These, we sometimes put, put those, bring those two words together, but they are separate. Prabhupada had one mission to bring people to Krishna consciousness. But he had many different moods. And one mood was build temples, another was distribute books, another was cow protection, another was, was devotee care. He had so many moods that he emphasized at different times. So depending on individual person's bhava, within the broad mission of Srila Prabhupada, different devotees may take up different moods. And that's what has practically happened with our various leaders in our movement. And similarly, when you talk about Krishna's will, Krishna's will doesn't have to be like a one thin line. You know, if you do this, only then you are doing Krishna's will. It's an overall direction. 
It's like an expressway and different people may choose different lanes. We ourselves might change from one lane to another. Now that does not mean if I'm taking a U-turn, I'm saying I'm on the same lane. No. There are clearly things which will take us away from Krishna. But as devotees, it is not, we have to understand that Krishna is not something like a diabolical God. He is not saying, you know, if you, if you don't follow my will, you're going to go to hell. And I won't tell you what my will is. It's not like that. It's not that Krishna wants us to do something and deliberately hides that from us. Krishna's overall mood is that it's an expression of love. That Krishna wants us to love us, love him, and then do our actions as an expression of that love for him. So when there is that loving service attitude in the heart, then we will use our intelligence, we will use our scriptural knowledge, we will use the association of devotees, and then we'll make it a scene. just like if we love someone, if you have a child, and okay, where should the child take education? We are trying to decide that. No, there is a whole in a loving relationship. There's a gamut of resources we use. Yeah, my concern for the child, maybe the experts, the child's desires, and okay, this call university is good, this university is not so good. So like that, the essential point of doing Krishna's will is that we have that deep service attitude, and then we act. Arjuna himself says, Karishye vachnam tava, I'll do your will. And the end of the Bhagavad Gita. But if we so see what happens after that, when Arjuna is fighting war, a war, it is not that before shooting every arrow, Arjuna is asking Krishna, Krishna, do I have your permission to shoot this arrow? Should I shoot here, should I shoot there? No, Krishna lets Arjuna be his own person. Now, when there are major decisions to be made, definitely Krishna gives advice to Arjuna. Sometimes Krishna intervenes directly. But Arjuna doesn't become a lesser of a person by his surrender to Krishna. He becomes more purposeful. So that's why uh, we don't have to be uh, confused. So when you say, certainly you're concerned that we don't want to be sentimental. So we don't want to be too sentimental. We don't just want to be simply rational and not consider sentiments. So we have a gamut of resources and we use all of them. Buddha, Bhava Samanvitaha. In 10.8 it says, Buddha, you use the rational faculty, Bhava Samanvitaha. That the great devotees, they surrender to Krishna with their rational faculty and with their emotional faculty. It's a gamut of resources all coming together to help us decide how to move closer to Krishna. I hope that answers the question. So, thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Krantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Kaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Prima Nandi.